Most people know about Xerox PARC as just Xerox, as in the copy machines that you see in an office space. But in reality, PARC was a research division of Xerox, and still is today. But from the 1970s to the 1990s, Xerox PARC was the epicenter of completely different ideas about human-computer interaction and modern computing. This is where we got the beginnings of Ethernet, the modern graphic user interface, and something more, something called ubiquitous computing, and the beginnings of what is now called calm technology. This was a place where you could go as an anthropologist or a technologist and think very, very differently about how the future of computers could be. It was a test bed where people could go in and make futuristic technologies 30 to 40 years before they actually appeared on the market. The people there were far ahead of their time, and some of them aren't around anymore to tell their story. And this is why it's really important for me to tell that story, because we're now in the world that researchers at Xerox PARC predicted, and we're going to run into the same issues they did, except it will cost us a lot more. Where did the idea of calm technology come from? Well, it came from a number of people, Mark Weiser, John Seely Brown, and Rich Gold at Xerox PARC. Mark Weiser was really interested in the future that he called pads, tabs, and boards. He thought that the future would have a lot of devices that would increase in power but retreat in size. And he said that that will fundamentally alter the human relationship between technology and how we actually live our lives. And this meant that all these tiny little devices would be part of our lives and they would start capturing our attention all of the time. My favorite quote from him is that the limited resource in the 21st century will not be technology, but it will be attention. And he started writing papers on this. He started asking questions of what would the future landscape of humanity look like with all these different devices, where instead of having mainframe computers where there were many people per computer, there would be many devices per person. And he looked at this and coined a term called ubiquitous computing, which we now know as the Internet of Things. This is a picture of Mark Weiser and John Seely Brown, who worked together on calm technology and a number of papers. After they did a lot of research, made a lot of prototypes, they wrote down the things that they discovered about how attention works with people, how technology works with people, how you can build technology that doesn't get in the way and lets people live their lives. Unfortunately, Mark Weiser died in 1999, just when his technology and his observations are becoming really relevant to today's world, he's not around to be with us. This is why it's really important for me to kind of tell people about this, tell people why they should be worried about constraints and bandwidth and privacy and security, and how they could apply his principles of calm technology to improve the world around them and to make better decisions and save money in product development. When I was a sophomore in college, I stumbled upon a paper called The Coming Age of Calm Technology and also another paper called The World is Not a Desktop. In the coming age of calm technology, there were three ideas proposed that I really liked. One of them was that technology should use the least amount of attention possible and no more. And two, that technology should make use of the periphery, as in your peripheral vision. And there were three examples outlined in this paper that I thought were really interesting to look at. They're called the window, the teapot, and the dangling string. I'll go over all of them in detail. The window stands for the inner office window. Mark Weiser in his paper, The Coming Age of Calm Technology, talked about the inner office window as something that is a slight transparency at the top of an office that allows you to see whether somebody's inside or not without violating their privacy. And the idea behind this is that you can ambiently understand whether somebody is there or not without actually having to check in on them. Is the light on? Is there movement going on? Someone's there and they're occupied. Or you can knock on the door and go in. If the light's off, no one's there. That's pretty straightforward. It doesn't require a lot of technology, but it also doesn't violate anybody's privacy. The second example, and my favorite example, is the teapot. A teapot is a prime example of calm technology because you can set it, forget it, and it calls attention to you when it needs your attention. So for instance, put water in it, and it has a status shout. It shouts at you that it's done. It makes use of your peripheral vision because you can do, or rather, your peripheral senses, because you can do something in the background while you're waiting for the teapot to go. You can be in a completely different room, and under its own power, under its own steam, it's able to speak to you. 
it doesn't give you a disembodied human voice that says, I'm done. It just has a status shout. And it's unambiguous. You know that it's a tea kettle that's going off. Another example is an art project that Mark Weiser did with Natalie Chermanjenko at Xerox Park. It's called The Dangling String. It was a piece of plastic rope suspended from the ceiling at Xerox Park that was connected to the network. And what would happen is if anything interesting was going on the network, if there was a lot of packets going through the network, the string would go brrrr. It would start to make this whirring sound and actually move around. And this became a signal making something that was formerly invisible, like the network, very visible. It was a signal that something interesting was going on. So instead of gathering around a water cooler, researchers at Xerox Park could see, hmm, something interesting is going on in the network. And then they could walk around and figure out who was doing something interesting. This was this kind of symbol. And this is another way that you can use calm technology. Take something that was formerly invisible, make it visible in some way, and then people can kind of congregate around it. So I really like these three examples from this paper.